Sunday, you guys feeling good? You glad to be together this morning? 
I'm so glad that we're together. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. Let's take a second and say hello to the people around us. Praise him, church. Come on, isn't he good? Isn't he good to us? We serve an awesome God. We're so lucky to have such a good, good God. Someone strong, stronger than anything that we can conjure up. Stronger than any doubts, any fears, any sins in our lives. Let's keep singing to him. Let's praise him. i 
shame and sinfulness, you rose again, victorious. Faithfulness that can deny through the storm and through the fire. That sets me free, Jesus Christ, who lives in me. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord.
can take a seat. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to have you here today. And I want to say a special welcome to our guest here this morning. If you'd like to know a little bit more about fellowship, I invite you to take the connect card that's in the seat back in front of you. Complete that and drop it in the offering basket or take it to our connecting center on the second floor concourse. We'd be glad to get you some uh, new information. Here at Fellowship, we place high value on serving our church, our city, and our world. And today, we have a couple of those focuses to tell you about. We have some of our community partners out on the concourse, and these are places where we serve our city. And I would love to invite you to go out there and meet our partners. Fill out an interest card if you would like to serve, or take your family, or maybe your life group, some of your friends, and go serve with some of our community partners. Also this morning, I want to tell you about something that we are doing together as a church called Operation Christmas Child. I know many of you have been involved in this in years past, and you've heard about it, and maybe you heard about it last week through our announcements. But our goal is to gather together as a church and collect hundreds of shoeboxes that will be distributed all over the world in conjunction with Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse. Actually, millions of these shoe boxes go all over the world. You can get shoe boxes like this. I think that we're out of those this morning, the last time I checked. But you can grab a shoe box at Hobby Lobby. You can grab a shoe box out of your closet. You can go to the dollar store and get a plastic shoe box. Fill it up with things like school supplies, hygiene items, uh, and then bring it back sometime between November 17th and 24th, and we'll do the rest. I had the incredible privilege several years ago of handing out and distributing about 2,000 of these shoe boxes in West Africa. It was really a life-changing moment for me, and it's why I, I really love what we're doing here. And you know it's not about the shoe box. Because what comes in that shoe box, in addition to the, the things that you can get to fill it up, is the gospel. This is a way that you can be involved in sharing the gospel around the world. Because as those shoe box are distributed, they're also sharing the truth of Jesus Christ with children. And that, of course, then spreads to their family. So I want to invite you to do that. We have a table out here at the Connecting Center. You can pick up a brochure. And then you can fill it up and bring it back in mid-November. So would you please join me now in praying for these that will receive these shoe boxes, praying for our community partners, and also asking the Lord to bless our offering. Let's pray together. Lord God, what a privilege to be here. What a privilege to partner with those in our city. 
What a privilege to partner with those in our world, and we thank you for that opportunity. Lord, I pray for our community partners that they would continue to have a reach in our city and places that are hard to go and people that are hard to reach. Father, I pray that they would reach them with the love of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for the children and those families that will hear the good news through the distribution of these shoeboxes all over the world, that your name would be honored and that your name would be glorified on this earth. And Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to give to things like this. And we ask that you would bless it, Father, that every penny, nickel, and dime would go for your kingdom impact. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. You are so worthy of praise. God, thank you for bringing each of us here. Let this time be something that is equipping for your church, equipping for your kingdom. 
God, we pour out our hearts to you and we praise you, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Gary Brandenburg. I'm one of the relief pitchers uh, here on the staff at Fellowship Dallas, and it's a privilege to be with you this morning. Uh, Jana and I have spent almost the whole month of October uh, in Dakar, Senegal, West Africa, and been serving alongside some incredible people that work with Mercy Ships. We've been on the Africa Mercy, um, doing, helping doing uh, free... Uh, I didn't do the surgeries. They do free surgeries. They for some reason wouldn't let me do any of those. And uh, I've been uh, trying to encourage the crew and the staff. In fact, Sarah, one of our worship singers, uh, she's there right now as a nurse uh, involved in the surgeries there. So um, we've been in a difficult place. Mercy Ships goes to the poorest of the poor. And um, so if you're gonna be on the ship, you're gonna be in a very, very poor place. So it was a, a, a joy to return home on Wednesday. If you've ever had that experience, you walk through passport control, they stamp your passport and say, welcome home. And uh, you hear those uh, lovely words uh, when you come home. But not, no sooner than we got home, I started getting bad news. Um, we had heard about the tornadoes, but had no idea uh, just how bad they were. And um, I was driving past Royal and Preston and saw some of those homes and I was thinking to myself, man, what if you owned one of those really, really nice homes and it was completely wiped out and across the street your neighbor is just unscathed? And you say, man, why? Why my house? And then I was on social media, I was reading something that Tony Evans had posted and I knew that Tony's wife, Lois, had cancer, but I didn't know it was as bad as it is and Tony said, we've We've given up on chemo, we've given up on radiation, and unless the Lord intervenes, her time on earth is short. And it made me so sad, and I think about the Evans family, and we, our church, you may not know this, but our church actually helped pay Tony and Lois's salary for the first three years as they started that church. And so I think that was a pretty good investment. And then I think of their kids, Anthony, who's just, I've known Anthony for 20 years since he was a kid, and He's come and he's sung for us. And, and Jonathan, their son, who's the chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys, and Crystal, who leads women's groups and is an author, and then Priscilla Shire. I don't know what she does, but she does a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and I think of them maybe about to lose their mama. I think, why? I mean, how is it that sometimes just godly people, their lives are cut short and nasty old godless people seem to live forever. And then, uh, and then I read the story that you probably read last week about the baddest of bad men, Abu, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and how he was taken out by special forces. He was eliminated from the face of the earth uh, in Operation Kayla. And Operation Caleb was named uh, after a beautiful young woman who was a follower of Jesus, and she decided she wanted to go to Syria um, so that she could serve Doctors Without Borders and serve alongside them. And while she was serving there in Aleppo, she was taken captive by ISIS and ultimately became an interest of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who abused her and tortured her and ultimately killed her. Before that, she was able to get a message out to her parents, and she said, I have been shown in darkness light, and I have learned that even in prison, one can be free. And she may have been able to get out like some of them did, if only she would renounce her faith, but she refused to do that. And I, I, I think of these kinds of things, like, why does a beautiful young follower of Jesus who just wants to do good in the world, how does she end like this, treated so inhumanely? 
And, I, and I, I look at stories like that, and so do you. We look at these things, and we wonder to ourselves, what in the world is going on? Why does that happen? And we conclude just sort of a, we have nothing else to say other than, well, life just isn't fair. There just seems to be a, a lopsidedness and a, a randomness about all of it and who's going to get cancer and who's going to get rich and who's going to lose their house in a tornado and who's going to lose their life as a martyr. Is there any kind of sovereign logic to this? These are questions that we ask all the time. These are questions our friends ask. And we're stuck with trying to give some kind of answer to that. And, and, and I will say that if you ask me those questions, I'll have to tell you, I'm sorry, that's way above my pay grade. But, but I do have an answer to this question. Why do some people respond with joy in spite of the worst possible circumstances, while other people remain chronically unhappy, even though they're surrounded by everything. They have it all. How, how can I find joy in this crazy life? How, how can I find happiness? Because we all want to be happy. I don't know if you know this, Americans aren't very happy not according to the uh, annual world happiness scale. There's actually a study every year uh, ranking countries by happiness. Uh, in spite of the fact that we're like the envy of the world in many ways and this great, we're, we're wealthy and we have everything we could ever want, we are number 19 on the world happiness scale. <laughs> I mean, we're behind Iceland and they eat fermented shark just for the fun of it. I had that stuff. It's nasty. We're behind Belgium. They put mayonnaise on their French fries. And they're happier than we are. How can we find happiness in this world? The answer is contained in this, uh, this book called Philippians. The secret of Paul's happiness is no secret. He wrote a whole book about it, or at least a letter. Um, the dominant theme in these four chapters that we are considering together is joy. Joy is the noun. Rejoice is the verb. And, and those words occur at least 16 times in these four chapters. Either joy as a noun or rejoice. And, and by the way, let me just say this to you because I, I used to teach this. I used to teach that happiness and joy are not the same thing. Happiness is dependent upon circumstances and joy is a fruit of the Spirit. I don't believe that anymore uh, because it doesn't hold up under biblical scrutiny. I won't take the time to go through it with you, but if you want to just look at it, just study the word happy or happiness in your concordance. And you'll find out that it's almost synonymous to joyful. It's not a bad concept. In fact, God is kind of in favor of both of them. So I'll use interchangeably joy and happiness. But Paul here gives us the secret of his happiness. And what we're going to see this morning is that when you build your life on a flimsy foundation, you risk profound unhappiness. But when you follow the infallible Christ and you tether your life to him and to his promises, man, you can experience a deep and abiding joy regardless of your circumstances. I mean, if you think being happy is like winning the lottery, some people get it and some people don't, then your chance of being happy is about like your chance of winning the lottery. <clears throat> so um, let's take a look at, we're going we're gonna to back up just a little bit because uh, I want to give you three sources of Paul's happiness. 
And the reason I picked three is because there is a word that he uses that's only used by Paul, and it's only used three times in the whole New Testament, and I think it's a very significant word. It's a word that I've always enjoyed uh, thinking about. It's the word progress. And I want you to see, first of all, that joy, from Paul's perspective, joy results from the progress of the gospel. Go back to chapter 1, verse 12. He's writing to the Philippians who are all very concerned about Paul. He spent two years in their city, so they know him well, and they've heard that he's in prison. <clears throat> They're very concerned, so he writes, and he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, the New American Standard says, has, has served for the progress of the gospel. That's the word that Paul uses only three times. I want you to know that even though I'm in prison, and I don't really want to be in prison, but since I am in prison, I want you to know that my circumstances have worked out for the progress of the gospel. In fact, the whole praetorian guard, all of these godless Roman soldiers have actually now heard the gospel because I'm in here. How else would they have ever heard the gospel? So I get thrown in prison and I've been sharing with all of them this wonderful good news about how God wants to take up residence in our lives and live with us forever. And so he says, I want you to know that my circumstances have worked out for the greater, his dominant desire is the progress of the gospel. Can I ask you, let me just ask you a straightforward question. What is your dominant desire? Well, my dominant desire is just to have a good weekend every once in a while. My dominant desire is that the Cowboys win the Super Bowl. My dominant desire is to have enough money when I retire so that I can do nothing the rest of my life. What's your dominant desire? I wonder sometimes how a lot of people around us would answer that question because it seems to me that increasingly Americans are people who believe in nothing and care for nothing and seek to know nothing and interfere with nothing and enjoy nothing and hate nothing and find purpose in nothing and they live for nothing and they only stay alive because there's nothing worth dying for. Paul was consumed with the message of the Bible and the message of the gospel and this good news that God, God, the one and only God wants to actually come and live within our lives and live with us forever. You know, in England, there is this interesting practice. Wherever the queen goes, wherever she's in residence, wherever she lays down at her head at night, there's a flag, not the British flag, but the, uh, the royal standard, the queen's flag, and it always flies above the house where the queen is to let everybody know the queen is here. And I thought of that this past week when I was reading these words of Paul, and I realized that joy is the flag that flies over our lives announcing that the king is here. The king is in residence. I wonder if people see that flag flying over your life. It's optional, by the way, because Paul will talk about, don't any, don't any more grumbling and complaining, and, because that's our tendency. So first of all, Paul says, I want you to know, I've, I've got, man, I am a happy man. I'm not in happy circumstances, but I'm a happy man, because you know what? The gospel's going forward. And then he says, here's the second place he uses the word progress, Joy results from the progress of others. When I see other people making progress, when I get to be part of other people making progress, that makes me happy. Chapter 1, verse 23, Paul says, man, I, I don't know what I'd rather do. I, I want to die, and I want to go be with Jesus. Because that's, I can't, and some of you, I know some of you have felt that way. 
I mean, I've done everything I want to do. I'm tired of this crazy life. I'm ready to go be with Jesus. And he says, I'm, I, I want to do that, but, I, but I'm, I'm going to fight on and try to get out of here. He says in verse 23, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that's far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. It's more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with you all. Why? For your progress and your joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. I, I, this, uh, it, this sounds so simplistic, but I think it's just a different way of, of, of looking at what it is we believe, but, but taking an active interest in other people is kind of what Christianity is about. You know, I mean, if you ever met, I've met people. I, I've met people that say, well, you know, I love the ministry. It's people I can't handle. <laughs> I mean, I kind of get that. It's usually said out of frustration, but, but the truth of the matter is, well, hold on. If you're not committed to the progress of other people, I mean, in what sense are you a servant of Jesus Christ? Because we're going to see in a minute, that's all he was about. Jesus said it this way. It's very simple. He said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you go to church every Sunday. No, no. Oh, I know what it is. By this all men will know you're my disciples if you read your Bible every day. Man, it's so clear. By this all men will know you are my disciples if you Set aside your own personal interests and take an interest in someone else. That's what love is. The, the thing that keeps drawing me back to these poor African countries and having a chance to work with mercy ships is I'm amazed to watch what happens when they're doing free surgeries. They're taking massive tumors off of people. They're, they're, they're taking care of children with cleft lips because in those cultures, sometimes they're buried alive because they think they're cursed. And so mama brings them hoping that they, they'll help and they repair that cleft palate. It's not that big a deal for a good surgeon. And as they do that and they help people who are in dental pain, think about this, in African countries, the average number of teeth that are being pulled every day on one person that appears at the dental clinic is five. Their teeth are just they're infected and sometimes they have to dig down into bone and, and these people are just, they're at, they've got sepsis through their body because of in, infected teeth and, and they come and they help and then, and then, and then it's wonderful. Because then I've had this happen twice. And someone says, All right, <clears throat> why do you do this? Because we thought there was a hook. We thought that you were doing this to get something from us, but we realize you're just doing it because you want to do it. Because you're Christians. And then they say, tell me about Jesus. And when it happens, I think to myself, how come we don't live lives in such a way that people come up to us and go, wow, I've just seen that joy in your life. You've gone through hell and you're still happy. Why is that? Well, let me tell you. Joy results from the progress of others. Look at chapter two, verse one. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. I know we have a few seminary students around here. It's a first class condition. The use of if could also be translated since. Since these things exist, uh, then complete my joy, Paul says. I am so happy when I see these things happening, when I see you all getting along so well, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and with one mind. He says, man, that's what really makes me happy when, when I see you working together in, in such a united way. And you do it. The only way you'll do it is from a position of humility. Verse three, 
Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others more significant than yourselves. Now that's a, I mean, you could just stop right there and say, man, how, how's that happen? He didn't say, consider other people important. He says, consider other people more important than you. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but pay attention to some other people's interests too. And then what Paul does, it's, it's fascinating. I've looked at chapter one and two and I've spent a lot of time just meditating on these two chapters and I realize what Paul is doing. He's making a selfless sandwich. He takes one piece of bread, which is chapter one, and he gives the example of his own selfless humility. And then at the end of chapter two, and we won't go that far this morning, but you can read it, it's about Timothy and Epaphroditus. And these are two men that he holds up and says, esteem them highly because they risked their lives for, to, to check on me, to make sure that I was okay. They did this selflessly. So he talks about his own example in chapter one. He talks about Timothy and Epaphroditus' example at the end of chapter two. But in between, oh, there's where the meat is. In between is the, one of the meatiest passages in the whole New Testament. Look at verse five. Have this mindset among you. Here's how you're going to have to think. If you're going to be committed to the progress of other people, have this attitude that is also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. I don't like that word grasp. That's one of the hardest words to say in the English language. Grasp. I wish there was another word, clung to or hung on to. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. If you want to know the, gra the greatest distance between two points, just consider how far it is from the right hand of the Father to come to this sorry planet. And not only that, he didn't just come as a man. He came as the most despised kind of man. Being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Only convicts get put on crosses. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. He's bestowed on him the name that's above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and everything, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some will confess him voluntarily. Some will confess him involuntarily. But one day, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah. Man. Now, I'm going to do a deep dive here. I, you, you, I don't think you can spend any time in these verses without having to at least address um, one of the most important theological concepts in all of Christianity. And this will help you because if you're ever out and having casual lunch with someone, you'll be able to finally answer that question that they, everybody asked, like, explain to me the hypostatic union. But that's what it's called when the Bible basically says that Jesus, being the one of a kind one, when it says only begotten in John 3, 16, it's not talking about God had an only child. Only begotten means one of a kind. And one of the things that makes Jesus one of a kind is that he is fully human and fully divine. And, and the Bible basically affirms this idea in this beautiful Christological passage that Jesus was fully God and fully man. And, and by the way, this is why this is important. If Jesus was not God, then he would have no authority to forgive sin. You can... We're humans. We can't forgive sin. I can't walk into a dinner party and go, hey, by the way, I just want to give you a little gift tonight. You're all forgiven. 
I love that. Even that passage in Mark 2 where the, the guys are tearing up the roof, the four friends, the stretcher bearers, and they lower the lame man down in front. I just picture that. I love that scene, man. Stuff's coming down off the roof and people are trying to have Bible study and they go, what's this about? And, and finally the guy gets lowered down and Jesus looks at him and goes, oh, your sins are forgiven. And I just want to see the look on that guy's face like, that's not what I came here for. That's what Jesus says. Basically, Jesus says, look, here's the priority. I, I'm going to make you walk. That's easy. But I want you to know your sins are forgiven because I have the authority to forgive sin because I'm God. Only God can forgive sin. That's why he had to be divine. But listen, if he were not a human being, then he could not be your high priest. Book of Hebrews says that in order for him to be high priest, he has to be like us. He has to be human. So if he's not God, he can't forgive sin. If he's not human, he can't represent us as our high priest. And so this passage affirms that Jesus is God and man. You've got all kinds of passages. and This is just one place where Jesus, because every once in a while someone says, well, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Okay. I guess he never walked up and said, hey, by the way, I'm God. He would have lived a very short life. It was shorter than what he lived. But in all of his I am statements, in statements like he made to that man, your sins are forgiven. And then all of these other passages in Scripture, Hebrews 1, 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Colossians 1, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. doesn't mean he was created. It means firstborn, meaning his power priority above all other human beings. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. All things were created through him and for him. John 1, 18, no one has seen God, the only God. Well, then how would we know what God is like? Well, uh, he has made him known. Jesus has explained God to us. When you see Jesus, you see God. That's why when Philip in John 14 says to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I got a favor to ask. Show us the Father. <laughs> I think Jesus did one of those. Oh. <laughs> Philip, I mean, I've been with you for a year now. You say, show us the Father. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Jesus is God. In Jesus, we have the full revelation of God the Father by God the Son. The second person of the triune Godhead reveals the first person of the Trinity. From eternity past, Jesus Christ has always existed in the form of God. It's very important. It's impossible to understand. Okay? Because there are no examples like it, all right? Because we don't really understand. And, and, and this is difficult for us. It was difficult when I talked to Muslims. Because I just talked to Muslims about Jesus. And they think we're, we're, we're heretics, we're, we're blasphemers, because they say we believe in three gods. And they're a monotheistic religion. And I try to explain, but we're a monotheistic religion. But in their view, they think we worship three gods, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Actually, most Muslims don't think that we worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is true. They think we worship Father, Son, and Mary. Because that goes way back to when Islam was founded in the 600s and Roman Catholicism was dominant. And it appears, always still, still appears, that Roman Catholics worship Mary. So they think we're heretics because we worship God along with Jesus and along with Mary. So it's very hard to explain because Jesus is the son of God. And when we hear that, we think, well, that's, hold on a second. And it's a good question. Some of you are new to the faith or you're still considering it. It really is a good question. Well, hold on a second. He's God, but he's the son of God? Seriously? Like, I can be, I can either be me or, I mean, my dad can't be me and I can't be my dad and my, how can he be, here's the deal. We have no way to explain who Jesus, how it's possible for Jesus to be God 
So we, the Bible uses what's called accommodated language. It uses words that we can understand to give us some concept of the relationship, and it calls him the Son of God, meaning he is of the same nature as the Father. So in that sense, I mean, my son has, a, is, is some, has something of my nature. He, he hates that fact, but the truth is he can't escape it. And so we use the word son. Islam teaches God has no son. So that was interesting two weeks ago when I'm having a Bible study with Muslim men. And I'm teaching them about Jesus. And I'm praying that I get better at it because they're wonderful people that are working there. And, and these men were very interested in what I had to say. Um, so Jesus is fully God. And Jesus is fully man. And listen, here's one of the reasons this is important. You cannot comprehend the humility of Jesus if you don't first understand who he is. Because humility is demonstrated in the contrast between your position and your practice. Stay with me here for a second. If, 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 if I go have lunch after this, and I'm sitting in a restaurant, and I notice at the next table there's a busboy, and he's clearing uh, the table... I don't look over there and say, wow, oh, what a humble guy. Why? Because that's his job. Now, he might be a humble guy, but the point of the fact is that's not why he's clearing the table. He's clearing the table because he's a busboy. He gets paid for that. On the other hand, let's say I'm at one of those fancy restaurants that has somebody's name on it that actually owns the place. And let's say the owner comes out and he puts on an apron and he starts clearing the dishes and he takes them back to the kitchen and he's washing the dishes. I'm going, oh, hold on a second. That really gets my attention. That's, that, that might be the indication that this is a humble man because humility is demonstrated in the contrast between position and practice. And Jesus is God, and yet as God, he was willing to come down and condescend at our level and become like us. And he was willing not only to be like us, but even to be a, 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 a servant, and he was willing to stoop. And that's the nature of our God. We don't worship a cranky old God that we can't really know. We don't worship a capricious God that says, well, I'll zap that you. And we, we worship a God who says, you know what? I, what I, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts, your thoughts, but I, I, I'm interested in your good. And I will come to earth so that you get the message. Now, very quickly, let me just mention that this whole idea of the the divinity and humanity of Christ has been debated since Jesus, and there have been a whole bunch of heresies, and a heresy is just a departure from historic Christian doctrine that has been worked out through the diligent study of Scripture. And there have been lots of heresies that have sprung up trying to, trying to somehow f solve this issue of God's humanity, God's divinity. See, for example, some groups, um, they, would, um, they would hold that, uh, to the divinity of Jesus, but not his humanity. Uh, docetism, Gnosticism, Apollinarian, there's a bunch of them. But, th but they would deny the humanity of Christ. They would say, well, Jesus was God, but he wasn't a man. He just looked like a man. It was kind of like a, you know, a hologram, or in his case, a holy gram, just a holy gram. He looked like God, uh, he looked like he was divine, but he, he, he you know, and, or he looked like a man, but he wasn't really a man. Other groups would hold to the humanity of Jesus, but not his divinity. Uh, those groups would be like Arianism, uh, Nestorianism, and modern ones like Jehovah's Witnesses and like Mormons. And some of you are struggling with that one because you're going, but I thought Mormons were Christians because they're so nice. And if you're nice, you must be a Christian. They talk about Jesus. Listen, I, I have no beef with the Mormon 
people. But I do have a beef with Mormon doctrine because Mormon doctrine teaches that Jesus was a pre-existing spirit who was exalted and became like God, and you too, like Jesus, can become like God. We can become little gods. And Jesus was the spirit brother of Lucifer. Which I don't really fully get that except that they use books other than the Bible to make the case. And so um, there are groups that deny the, it's a great test to ask anybody uh, if you don't know what group they're coming from, just ask them, who do you think Jesus is? Is he a man or is he God? That would be interesting. That would be an, I'd like to be at the table for that conversation. And Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says, yes, fully human, fully divine. Um, but the point of the whole thing is that Jesus humbled himself, and he is to be our example as we experience the joy of serving other people and being committed to their progress and their growth in the faith. Listen, it, if you're not happy, it may be part of the reason that you're not happy, in spite of the fact that you're surrounded by all kinds of cool stuff and lots of toys. If you're not happy, it could be because you're not committed to the progress of someone else. You're living for yourself. Joy results from the progress of the gospel. Joy results from the progress of others. And here's the last one. Joy results from my own personal progress. The only other time Paul uses the word progress is in his instructions to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, when he says to Timothy, this young man that he has uh, nurtured, he says, Timothy, practice these things. What things? All the stuff he talked about in the first four chapters of 1 Timothy. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that your progress will be evident to all. If I could give you one word of encouragement today, you know what I would want you to do? I would want you to leave here today and you would say, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna make progress. I wanna know more about Jesus tomorrow than I know about Jesus today. I wanna be more like Jesus in 2020 than I was in 2019. Because I don't think God expects moral perfection from any of us. I know the Bible says, be ye perfect as I am perfect. I understand that. That, that word perfect means complete. And even Philippians, it says, you know, he who began that good work in you will complete it. But are you committed to that completed project? Are you committed to make progress so that that process can be complete? And that's not always a comfortable process. I ran across this little quote by David Gibson. He says, you will know that you know God when sometimes he makes you weep as he humbles your pride, reverses your expectation, upsets your priorities, offends your behavior. See, those are the, some of the tools that God uses to shape us and mold us into the people he created us to be. And God is recreating us in his image for his purpose. And Jesus suffered and died for a purpose that was greater than a few short years of human happiness. So I hope you have a desire for the progress of the gospel, that other people are entitled to know this good news. I hope you have a desire for the progress of someone else, because the gospel's not gonna make progress unless you're committed to someone else's progress, and you'll never be committed to someone else's progress till you're committed to your own progress. So how can I experience this transformation? And how can I be happy? And the answer is it all starts by tethering your life to the infallible Christ and to his um, precious promises. And I can't think of a better way to do that than to have communion. So the ushers are gonna come and pass out the elements and I want you to know that by partaking of this observance that you are declaring your desire to partake of Christ. You're, you're saying, I want to be like you, Jesus. 
I, I bow in worship before you. I call out in praise that you are master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. As these elements are passed, I want you to pay attention to the passage that's on the screen. I want you to meditate on that passage. Noah's going to come out. He's just going to sing over you. And he's going to sing a song that we've chosen to say, hey, you know what? It, it's for, for at least this moment, Lord, it's not about me. <laughs> There'll be plenty of time for me to think about me. But for this moment, Lord, I, I want to just think about you. And then I want to take communion and say, I, I'm all in. I want to be like you. So would you just, you might want to pray. You might want to just look at what's on the scripture. You might want to listen to what Noah's, the words that he sings. But um, if you're here today and, and, and you want to identify with Christ, take the wafer and the cup, hold on to it. And I'll come back up and we'll all partake together. Because it's all about Jesus. 
Think of yourself the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, <laughs> became human. And having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far above anyone or anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glory of God the Father. And Jesus took this bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And on that night, when he would spend his last meal with his disciples, he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this and remember. Remember who I am. Remember what I taught. Remember what I'm about to do. Let's eat. And then he took the cup a deep scarlet contents representing his blood, not fake blood, not the appearance of blood, but real, live human blood that Jesus would shed to pay the penalty for our sin and purchase a place in heaven for us. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim his death until he returns. Father, you are such a good God that you condescended to become like us so that we would understand the story. Lord, we confess, we still don't fully understand the story. But you've helped us today because we understand enough to know the only way we're ever going to be happy, the only way we're ever going to experience the joy that Paul writes about is by following hard after Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make your desires our desires. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, go from this place and go tell somebody about this wonderful good news that you've heard about today. Okay? God bless you. Have a great week.